Will you join with me in the greeting this morning? This is the day which the Lord has made. Amen. It's so good to see people in the sanctuary once again. Just in my rough math, there's about 18 of us in here in person. And I'm uh, glad to have those that are online with us as well. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just great to have people back in the sanctuary. I just say that. And uh, we're, we're glad to have you here. Uh, glad to be part of worship. Uh, tweaking a little few things during this season of Lent, just to uh, just because of the nature of how we're doing things. So that'll be in. Uh, you'll, you'll see that as we go in our transitions 
in our worship time together. Uh, but I'd like to share our announcements this morning. We have, uh, just a reminder, our food pantry donations will be cash until further notice. Bible study on Zoom tomorrow night. We will start meeting ushers, so if you're ready to come back, uh, the sign sheet is in the back of the sanctuary, I believe. Is that right, Judy? It's in the fellowship. Oh, sorry, it's in the fellowship hall. So uh, for ushers, um, pretty soon we're going to be needing some uh, liturgists, so uh, we'll let you know when that takes place. Um, I, we're looking pretty close, I think. Uh, possibly having our camera system, our new camera system installed in the next several weeks, hopefully before Easter. So we're, we're still waiting. It's getting closer and closer. Um, so that's, we're going to expand what we do up here at that time. Easter lilies, the sign sheet is in the fellowship hall. And we will also make sure that if you'd like to do it online, uh, uh, through our van code, we'll get that set up there as well. Um, each flower is ten dollars. Put your money in a cute envelope and mark it Easter lilies. For those that are here, put it in the offering plate, or you can mail it in a no line. Put who you want in memory of. And those are due by March eleventh. Any uh, other announcements anybody needs to share that are here this morning? If not, will you join with me in a word of prayer? Spirit of the ages, name us and claim us according to your purposes. As you once called Abram and Sarai long ago, bring our ears to hear your call and tune our hearts to open all of our senses to the sound of your voice. As we pick up our cross to follow you, Raise us to newness of life. For you call for you call us to be children of the covenant, of the promise that comes through Jesus. Heirs with Christ. Disciples of Jesus. In his name we pray. Our first song is Where He Leads Me.
the call to worship. God's voice names us in holy love. Christ's voice chastens us when we go astray. The Spirit's voice draws us back to the path of righteousness. Thanks be to God. Since I am doing two scripture verses for Lent, I want to share the first one at this time, Genesis, the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 7, and verses 15 to 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and will be great and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants. After you, for the generations to come to be your God, and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, Abraham As for Sarai your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai, her name will be Sarah. I will bless her, and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Our next hymn is El Shaddai.
they would like to lift up this morning. Yeah, Judy. Sarah. <laughs> That's great. So Judy has a, you said number six? Number six girls. Six, just all girls? Six great-granddaughters one great-grandson. Oh, okay. So six great-granddaughters and one great-grandson. New great-granddaughter born in Michigan named Sarah. That's appropriate for today. Any others that we want to lift up in prayer? Yes. So you got Karen's got two two grandchildren coming yeah. soon. Okay, well that's exciting and busy at the same time. Did you say Caitlin? Yeah, Caitlin. Rotator cuff surgery? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The end of this month. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Of course, we just need to continue to pray for um, our nation. Uh, we, we have good news coming, but um, we still need to be cautious. We still need to take precautions and uh, just be diligent. Um, but we're getting through, and that's the good news. That's awesome. And uh, I'm just so excited about how even in challenging times, God does amazing things in his church. So uh, the ministry keeps going. We may not have been in person in worship, but we still do ministry. And that's the good news. So I invite us all to pray together. And then I'll do my prayer, and then we'll do the Lord's Prayer together. So let us pray. Oh, gracious God, it is a joy to come into the sanctuary and see people once again. It's a new thing for churches all over the country, experiencing new ways of worship that has not been completely comfortable. But it has produced fruit. And we thank you for your amazing work and your spirit in doing those things. We come together this day and virtually and in person to celebrate, to worship your holy name. We know that there are so many problems in the world. There are so many struggles that we face in our nation, we face in our personal lives. But we hear today, this morning, of all these babies being born. And that just reminds us of the cycle of life. We are coming through winter, coming into spring. Hope and life and good news springs up. The warmer weather makes us feel good inside. And so that gives us hope. And I think of this pandemic in the same way. It's really been a very, very long winter. Isolation. Staying at home more than we're used to. We're not quite out of it yet, but we see the light. We see the hope. And we thank you, Father, for walking with us through this time. And as we continue to serve you, to worship your holy name, to reach out and touch people for Jesus, we just pray that you give us a heart and wisdom to see your direction. There's so many needs. So many. No one church can do them all. 
And so you put us all together, the global church, for each of us to do our part. We pray for the passion and the wisdom and the guidance to fulfill what we at Sidon are called to do in service to your kingdom. And we pray this day in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we take this time for tithes and offering, if uh, you have any that you have not turned in the offering plate, you can do it now, or you can do it after service. It's right there in the back. For those that are online, you, know, you can send your stuff. We have the online giving. You can mail them in. Uh, bill pay, whatever you want to do. So I just invite you to submit your tithes and offerings. The next scripture verse I want to read is from Romans, the fourth chapter, verses 13 to 25. These are the words that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. 
Therefore, the promises, promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's, Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls us into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Let us pray. Lord, we come to your word seeking your understanding and your wisdom. May your spirit touch our hearts here in the sanctuary, at home, or wherever we may be to know what it means to live in faith. You know, there's always been a de debate about who is the most important person out there. Our society has a funny way of putting value upon, really, how much you make. So the more you make, the more valuable you are. So based on that, our athletes tend to be the ones that look to be looked at as more valuable than most others, whereas... The debate is, well, what about the teachers that help them get to that location? And so I want to tell a story about this teacher who was nearing retirement that was considered a person that, well, you really don't have that much impact. But what this teacher did showed something that had an impact not only on her life, but on the impact of all the kids that were in her class and probably for the rest of their lives. And so the way the story goes, she was a school teacher in Michigan. And she had one day, she told her students to write down all your I can'ts. And so she did it as well. And this is some of the things that the teacher wrote. She said, I can't get John's mother to come for a teacher conference. I can't get my daughter to put gas in the car. I can't get Alan to use words instead of fists. And so that's what she wrote. And some other students wrote, a uh, little girl said, I can't kick the soccer ball past second base. I can't do long division with more than three numbers. I can't get Debbie to like me. Uh, I, a boy wrote, I can't do 10 push-ups. I can't hit the ball over the left field fence. I can't eat only one cookie. Uh, many of us probably have that problem. Well, actually, no, I do. But anyway... That were all their kids. And all the students did this, and they put them, after they got all this written, they put them in this shoebox. And they went outside, and they dug this hole. And they put, after they dug this hole, they put this shoebox with all the I can'ts in them, and then they covered back the hole. And the teacher did something that was really incredible. She did a eulogy, a funeral, for this box of I can'ts. And this is how she did her eulogy. Friends, we gather today to honor the memory of I can't. While he was with us on earth, he touched the lives of everyone, some more than others. Unfortunately, his name has been spoken in every public building, schools, city halls, and state capitals, and even in the White House. We have provided I can't with a final resting place and a headstone that contains this saying, he is survived by his brothers and sisters, I can, I will, I'm going to right away. 
They are not as well known as their famous relative and are certainly not as strong and powerful yet. Perhaps someday, with your help, they will make an even bigger mark on the world. May I can't rest in peace, and may everyone present, present pick up their lives and move forward in his absence. Amen. So after they did that, they went to the classroom, and they got cookies and punch, and they celebrated. And it was a big bar party, and she got this little cut-out tombstone. Uh, she put it on the wall, and throughout the whole year, if ever a student said, I can't, she pointed to the tombstone and said, I can't is buried. It's all about I can or I will. You know, uh, I think if we think about our own lives, maybe at different parts, we struggle with our own I can'ts. We've said those maybe at a young age, maybe at an older age. I think one of the, the, the biggest I can'ts for me happened you know, I had some when I was a kid, but it happened when I was started in ministry, when I was going through seminary and, and things like that. And uh, Betty will testify to these. I, I said these often. My personal I can'ts were I can't preach. I can't be a church. And the most important was I can't be a pastor because of two things. One, I really don't like crowds. And second, I really don't like people. Well, you got to understand this was... 20, ooh, almost, what is it, 25? 25 years ago. So God's changed me a little bit, but a lot, I should say. And so that just shows that when you focus on those, I can't, it makes things worse. It was a miserable time for me, but God led me through that. And some of the other things people have said, I can't lose weight, I can't exercise, I can't go to church because it's beautiful outside. I can't go to church because it's rainy outside. I can't go to church because it's snowy outside. I can't go to church because it's windy outside. I've always said the only time people go to church when it's just kind of blah and there's nothing else to do. That's just a joke. I thank you all for being here today. But that, those are the things. We make excuses. I can't are kind of excuses so we don't have to do something. So we don't have to act upon what God may be saying we should be. We're going to talk about faith today. Lent, the season of Lent, one of the roots of our beliefs is faith. Faith is the counter to I can't, because it says I will. And this is the thing, when we got to believe in what we got to know, that when God wants us to do something, it will happen. It's guaranteed. When God wants us to do something, it will happen. It's a guarantee because God always does what God wants to do. Now, the tricky part is the only thing that can sabotage that a little bit is if we, God says to you, do something, and you say, I can't. Well, God's plan doesn't change because God will find somebody else. But God wants you to do. And God says to you, I want you to do it because God wants us to be part of his power, part of his glory, part of a witness to what he can do in this world. Amazing and incredible things. And so God says, do this. And what is our response? I can't or I will. Usually we don't say I can't. We come in some other way. We, say, we mask that I can't in I'm afraid, or I don't have a gifts. Those are, those are basically saying I can't. But we wouldn't acknowledge that because, well, I just don't have a gift to do that. Well, I didn't have a gift to do what I'm doing today when I started doing it. I, you know, I don't know if I shared this story. It was it just to give you an idea of where I was when I first started uh, ministry. I was 25, I think. I think something like that. My first church, 24, 25, something like that. I was never really raised in the church. But I, I was called when I was 17. And I never remembered this story, and they reminded me, this is a couple months ago, so I don't know if I ever shared this, but it, it just kind of amazing. My very first church, and she was, she was, I, I think, 
the day after she was born, she was in church. Probably. And so she was always in the church. And I go to this church, I'm the pastor, I'm appointed to this church, my very first church, I'm appointed to the pastor of the church. And it's a small church in Kentucky. And well, what, what is the tradition of the church when a new pastor comes? You have, you have a dinner, right? Or some celebration, sometime. So they're going to have this church dinner uh, that night. And I, I don't know how it got to the point. She, I really don't know how we got there, but um, it came up when she was asking me, you are going to that, right? It's like, why? I said, well, it is a church dinner. It's like, well, you mean I have to go to those things? She says, yeah, you're the pastor. You have to go. That's how clueless I was, okay? It's like, really, I have to go to those dinners? She's like, yes, every one of them. When there's something going on, you've got to be there. It's like, oh, okay. But, you know, if I go back to the first point, like, but I don't like crowds, and I don't really like people, so why am I here? Because God said, be there. It's like, okay. And so that just gives you an idea of where I've come from to where I'm at today. And that just says, you know, when you get past I say, I can't, and say, all right, God, I know you want me to do this. I'm really not, not sure how, but I believe in you. I have faith in you. And we get through it. God wants us to be part of something. He doesn't want us to say, I can't. He wants us to say, you know, I'm afraid, but I'll do it anyway. Paul Abraham, the, the scripture we read this morning, are what people would call pillars of faith in scripture. Monuments of faith. Examples of people to follow of faith. Now we don't really see doubts when you read about Paul. He was pretty confident. But I'm sure he had some I can'ts that were twirling around in his mind. But Abraham, he was full of those. And I wanted to share five of those with you. Uh, just simply five I can'ts with Abraham and Sarah of their journey that they had to overcome. The first one was when Abraham was called to go to a different land. He lived in Ur, which is in Iraq. And God said, leave. And Abraham said, well, I can't leave. This is my home. I don't know any other place to live. God also said to Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. Well, Abraham said, I can't because I don't have any children. How can I be the father of many nations? Sarah, in regards to her, God said, you are going to be the mother of many nations. You are going to bear Abraham a child. And she says, well, I can't. Mold. I mean, maybe my hand may hack her a little bit, but it can't be me. Later on, Sarah is confronted with some visitors that we believe to be angels that said she's going to have a baby this time next year. And she laughs. She says, I can't have a baby. I'm still too old. Then there comes a point where Abraham does have the son of promise. And he takes Isaac to sacrifice him. And he says, God, I can't do it. This is my only son. Yet, in all those instances, Abraham took those I can'ts and put them away and said, I will because I have faith. I believe in the promises of what God will do. This is what Paul used as Abraham as an example of faith, as someone that can do great things. But he, Paul had to, to shape this message in a different way because at this time, the law was well established. Abraham, it was, it was not at that time. But he just had the covenant, the promise. And so they would get the law later on. And so it's well established. And the people in Paul's day, the Jews especially believed, all you had to do was just follow the law. And everything was okay. What Paul understood was, 
No, it's impossible. You can't obey the law. Outwardly, you can do pretty good, but what's in the heart will always be struggling and always disobeying. Because those things creep up without us even realizing it. And so Paul was, was challenging his readers, his hearers, to understand that it's not by law, it's not by works, it's not by these outward things we do that we are blessed, that we learn and become faithful. It's by a relationship with God, it's by obeying God, like Abraham did, like Sarah did, like Paul did. It's about that obedience. It's about that relationship. It's not about those outward things. The, the equivalent I can think of today is that when we think about obeying law, we don't use those terms, but we say this, uh, we're, we're going to be okay as long as we go to church, read the Bible, and have a prayer time. But anybody can do that. If you don't have a relationship with God, then what is the point? It's about the relationship. It's about the, the personal part that God has with each one of us. That that's where our faith grows. And that's the key. Because faith is not something that just suddenly comes and you have, you know, like Abraham and as Paul say here, a pillar of faith. But we have to learn through, through, the, for, through our lives. we got to learn it's about a relationship. And so what happens when we exercise that faith? One of the things is that when we start believing and having faith, we let go of control. We let God be the one that takes away. We let go of our own strength and let God be the one that is strong. Every one of us is a little bit of a control freak. We're all at different levels, but we all want some bit of control. We want some bit of order in our lives that we have absolute control of. But when it comes to our relationship with God, when God asks us to do something, we have to let go of that instinct of control and say, God, I, I'll let you lead, even though I don't understand. The problem is that, you know, what I mean by that control is that we, we know we have to do something. We pray about it. But as soon as we pray about it, we go and try to solve it ourselves. And we don't let God work through our life. We don't let God answer that prayer. Because we want to take care of ourselves. One of those things that happened to me, again, while I was in seminary, I perceived at one moment in my life that we didn't have enough money. And it was a perception. We were okay, but it just felt like we didn't. And so I prayed about it. God, I, we, I need to do something about this, about needing more money. So I prayed, and immediately after I did that, I dropped out of seminary for a semester and got a part-time job. Was that what God wanted me to do? Well, I didn't wait for an answer. I just did it myself. Because I wanted to solve the problem, because there was a problem... I'm going to solve it and take care of it. So that lasted about a month. It's, it's kind of like the, the same example that God said to Sarah, you're going to be the mother of the nation. And he said, well, I'm too old, but here's my handmaid and had her. I'll let you know, Abraham sleep with her. And then that's how God's going to fulfill his promise. So she heard the promise and then she started praying about it and figured out on her own what she was going to do without really listening or consulting God. The same thing as I did. That's one of our dangers is when we rely on our own strength, our own abilities, our own wisdom, we miss out on what God can do. And that comes to what the second thing I want to share with you about faith is that when we exercise that faith, God can do things beyond what we could imagine. We have limited ability to think. It's finite. We can't see everything in our future. God can. And so when we take things in our own hands without consulting God or waiting for an answer, then we're missing out on what God can do and will do. God's 
For Sarah, God's plan was never for Hagar to be in there. It was for her. And then later on, she did become pregnant. She did bear the child. It did work out even when she was too old to bear children because it was a miracle. Because it was beyond what she could imagine. The same thing happened to me. I, I perceived the problem. I needed money. I was in school. Drop out of school. Get a job. And then, uh, as I said, this lasted maybe a month. And then I get a call from somebody in the church. Would you come over? Sure. Long story short, I came out of that with a thousand dollars and a saying, stop that job and get back to seminary. I was like, okay, God, I messed this one up. I'll go back and do what you're supposed what I'm supposed to do. It was beyond what I could possibly imagine would happen. And that's what happens when we exercise faith. When we see a challenge before us, even if it's, you know, this doesn't have to be a personal challenge, it could be a church challenge. It could be something that God says, this is what I want you to do, a ministry I want you to reach out to, a people I want you to serve. And we can say, well, we don't have the resources for that. That's also, I can't. But then when we pray about it, when we are convinced and convicted, this is what God wants us to do, then we know this is where I need to go. This is how I need to exercise faith. And know that it could happen in a way that is beyond my imagination. Because God still does miracles. But here's the good news for us all. Abraham, Paul, Moses, another example, all pillars and examples of faith, but they weren't born that way. It's a work in progress. It doesn't matter where you're at today. All you need to know is that if you know that God is working in your life, your faith will grow. It will be strengthened. Take Moses, for example. He led the people, the Hebrew people, out of slavery. Some 400,000 people, probably. When you do all the math, they were in slavery for 400 years. It took Moses 40 years in the wilderness, and before he was 80 years old, before he figured out how to have faith in God. So it's a work in progress. Our faith is a process. It's a journey. We have all this lifetime, and that's why we're here, is to grow in our faith and learn to be more faithful. To learn to see what God will do in and through us. So don't be discouraged where you're at today. Don't be discouraged and compare yourself with someone else. They say, well, they have so much more faith than I do. None of us were born with it. None of us get to faithfulness without challenges, without heartache, without doubts, without failures, without stumbling. We have to learn the hard way. And so we grow in our faith. So be encouraged. God is not done with you yet. God has your entire life to transform you and does take our entire lives. Until the day we die, we are learning and growing in faith. And not until we enter eternity do we receive the fullness of what it means to be faithful to God. Hebrews 11.1 is one of the great classic passages of faith. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Here is the hardest part of faithfulness. Abraham and Paul and Moses and the list goes on and on and on never saw 
what they are promised. Abraham knew, so was promised to follow many nations. He knew of a child. He was dead long before all his relatives came to be. So faith is exercising, doing God's will, knowing and convinced that God wants you to do something, also knowing that you may never see the fruits of your labor, that your faithfulness may be for a generation or two generations down the road, and you may never see the fruit of what God is doing to you. That is exercising true faith. Knowing that you may never see it. We always, we're results oriented people. We want to see results. We want to see uh, something from what we have done. And sometimes we're blessed with that, but sometimes we will never see what we are called to do. As I, I shared this before, the man that left the money of his church was, that was in his will. He didn't see his church built. He didn't see what this church would come to be. And every church has one of those stories. Many have sacrificed and done things that was not realized in their lifetime. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Because we cannot see the future. And that is good news for us. We just do our part. Our small part for the building of the kingdom. It doesn't have to be great. We just have to be a person willing to say, I will. And when those I can't start flooding into our head, which they always will, we just put them out, ignore them, say, I can with God. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your spirit that transforms us to be who we're called to be. Help us to practice faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our closing hymn is Lord of the Day.
and the power of Christ. Amen. Thank you.